From last week's session, we have figured out one thing, that God's love is immense. How immense is God's love? One, the fact that you exist is a big deal. Okay, we had a couple of numbers, right? What was the what was the um, possible what the probability of you being born? No, 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 say no. One in four trillion. Yes, four hundred trillion. Yeah, one in four hundred trillion. The probability that you would be born. Okay, so that's right. Okay, through no merit of your own. Number two, the probability that you exist now at this very moment. Ten to the power of sixty-five billion zeros. Right. So that number starting to look like zero every week. Yeah. Right? The probability that you exist in this very moment. That means you are being sustained. Sustained inside and outside. Alright? Do you know that on a microcellular level Jesus exists? It's true. It's not to make you feel nice. But that's who God is. God exists in every single cell in your body. And he's sustaining you. He's sustaining you in every single cell of your body. How do we know that? The numbers tell you. And it's not if you're a Christian or not a Christian. He sustains all of life. Because that is who God is. God is love. His love sustains you. Okay? And uh, you are uniquely made. How many people are there on this planet? Yeah, I was correct. I thought it was seven. So it's eight billion people. Alright? And yet you are uniquely made. How do you know you're uniquely made? Your eyes, fingerprints. Your eyes, fingerprints. Basic fingerprint. Look, hold up your thumbs. Hold up your thumbs, everybody. Yeah, look at your thumbprint. Hold it up. Hold it up nice and proud. Because you are thumbbody. <laughs> you are thumbbody. Somebody. <laughs> Um, I should not have put that in. Okay. So, um, anyway, you're somebody, and nothing you can do, you, nothing you can ever do, will make God love you less. You know, in the olden times, especially in Greek mythology, you did, <laughs> you you were not free. You did anything to upset any of the whatever number of gods there were in Mount Olympus and you were struck down or you were punished and whatever. You don't have to go as far as that. You can come to India as well and you know, all the millions of gods that Hinduism has. You could upset any one of them. You know, and that was it for you. But no, you can't upset God. You can't make God love you less. You can't make God love you more. So you can Go for daily mass, you can save 20 rosaries a day, you can do whatever you want, you can you can raise the heights of uh, sainthood, but you can't make God love you more. So even if you were lost to hell, God doesn't stop loving you. He doesn't. That's who God is. Okay? So we're setting the tone, God's love. Unimaginable, all in encompassing and intensely for you, individually. Like as if you were the only person living in existence. He has that, that depth of love for you, right? Today, we will talk about and unpack salvation. Now, when I say salvation, what was the first thing that came to your head? I like to do this because it helps us to kind of figure out where we are, if we are on the same page or not. So, when we say salvation, what does salvation mean to you? Okay. Any, any other images that come to mind when you say salvation? Jesus dying on the cross. Okay. Anybody else? 
being redeemed, okay? Being saved. Being saved. Anybody else? Salvation. Has anybody heard the, the, the song Salvation by the Cranberries? Salvation, salvation. You know that it's a rock and roll song. I mean, not rock and roll, it's like a pretty heavy, crunchy kind of song. Okay? So that's what comes to mind when I hear salvation. Yeah? So, anybody else has a, another quirky, remembers what salvation is? Come on. Hit me. Yeah? Okay. Nice show? Okay. Okay, good. So you you have images of that that come to mind, right? What else? Salvation? I mean the church. Jesus, you are my salvation. Yes, yes. Jesus, you are my salvation. Do we know what we are saying when we say that? You are my salvation. Do we know the actual definition of that? Of my life, that we know. <laughs> but what about that word, Jesus? You are my salvation. You're not, you are not one of my salvations, but you, you are my salvation. So what does that mean? Salvation comes from the Latin word salvatio. Okay? Which is further derived from salva, which means safe. Saved. So think back in prehistoric times, hunt, huntsmen, would go hunt for their food and then you never know when suddenly some prehistoric creature which was bigger than you, ferocious than you, thought you were food and came after you. And you ran, ran, ran and the creature just about to get you and you just make it to your cave. The creature can't reach you. It's that feeling of safe and safe. Yeah? So again, salvation means, essentially means saved okay and it means to mean something to you because what are you saved from if you talk about salvation you talk about jesus jesus is salvation so what are we being saved from what what are we being saved from i didn't know i was being saved from something what is it what did i do that i needed to be saved from so a lot of people have a lot of theories about it. A lot of people talk about how, you know, man sinned, man fell, and God sought to bring him back to his original status and more. But what's the big deal? I mean, this is God we're talking about. Couldn't he just snap his fingers and just make everything okay? Have we not thought that at some point? Yes. So what's the deal? Why, why all of this? So, um, how many of you, like you all, of, all of us have phones, um, except Eva. Um, <laughs> um, I want you to hold up your phone, you know, open, um, turn on the camera, and put it into the front-facing mode, okay? And if you have somebody next to you, just hold the phone towards that your partner's uh, phone. Okay, what is, what is likely to happen? Can you see what's happening there? If you hold the phone, you put it in the front facing, find somebody with another phone with the front facing. Yeah, so when you want to take a selfie, Correct. And now you hold it to somebody else's phone. So you have another phone like this. And what do you see? So try and look at that. Try and look at the image. Try and look at the image in that phone. Yeah, yeah. Bring the phone closer. You'll be able to make out what's happening. Can you see how it forms infinite images? Okay, okay, put, put your phones away, put your phones away. Remember when as children, I don't know if you 
done this. You take two mirrors and your know, science project is take two mirrors and hold them next to each other and you put your finger in, what, what would you see? Multiple images of your finger, right? It just seems to stretch into eternity. You can't, after a while you can't see it, but it is there. It's, it's constantly reflecting. So what is that? That's infinity, right? Okay. So I just wanted you to understand the concept of infinity. All right, you've got an image now of what infinity is. So our God is an infinite God. He is infinite. Infinity. He is infinite and infinitely good. Okay, think of the mirror image. He's in his goodness. There's no limit to his goodness. He is from where we derive goodness and all the good qualities of whatever we know. Okay, we need to understand that. God is infinite. Nelson said last week, in the beginning. But the Hebrew word for that is a timeless word. That was the beginning of the beginning. I mean, there's no concept of time. God exists. He is the very concept of to be. All right, that is who God. He's not just one being. He's not a being like we are beings. He's much further than that. He's <coughs> infinite. He's infinite. All right. We often don't. We don't understand who God is. We don't make time to try and figure out just how big is He? How big is He? He's infinite. Therefore, he is infinitely good. God is love. He is infinite love. Now, I've spent a lot of time describing that. Now imagine just one, one offense. One offense. Doesn't matter how big or how grave it is. It's an offense against who God is. That one offense, because he is infinitely good, is an infinite offense. It's an infinite offense because it's not like, oh, okay, it's done. No, it's because he's infinitely good. That one offense is an infinite offense to him. How is that possible? We look at each other and you slap one person and then you know we'll get into a fight and then you'll say okay, sorry, okay, fine. And then you'll kind of you go on with your life. But that is our fallen nature. But in God there's no such thing. He does not intend malevolence, he doesn't intend evil, he doesn't intend he only he is only good. And yet one offense is infinite against him. So, now I want to ask you to think about, has anybody ever been in debt? Where you owe somebody? You don't have to put your hand up. But have you ever had the feeling, or at least you know of someone who's been in really bad debt, that you owe that person, or you broke something of someone's? and you felt obliged, oh, should I need to replace that? Okay, at least all of us have felt that at some point? Yes. Okay. So, I want to bring your attention to the parable of the wicked servant. You remember the wicked servant? So there was this king who had a servant who owed him a certain amount. And the servant said that he can't pay. The king ordered that the servant should be imprisoned, and that his wife and uh, children should be sold into slavery. And the servant got down on his knees and he begged, he says, please, please, give me some time to repay the debt. The king was moved with pity for the servant and cancelled his debt. He cancelled his debt. He didn't give him time to repay his debt. He just said, you know what? Forget it. It's fine. Be free. The servant went out, hardly 
about 100 meters away. And he found that he met another person who owed him money. And he caught that person and he started to throttle him. He said, pay me what you owe me. Must have been feeling I wouldn't have been in that embarrassing situation if this guy had paid me. All, all sorts of things like that. And this man got on his knees and he said, please, give me some time to pay back. But that servant would have none, nothing of it. And he took him to what he thought was righteous justice. And he says, this guy is not paying me, put him into jail. And the friends of this man were upset. And they went to the king and said, this is what your servant has done. The king got even more upset and furious. <coughs> he summoned that servant back and he says, you wicked servant, you ungrateful person. I forgave you a debt which was much bigger than whatever was owed you. So he held, held that servant therefore and made sure that that, person, that servant paid back what he owed. Now, I want to draw your attention to the servant, the servant's friend, they were in debt. Okay? Many people in Dubai have experienced that. They experienced that in the hundreds of thousands of dirhams. And they see no way out. I want you to sit with that feeling. Sit with that feeling of it's an uncomfortable feeling. But we need to understand what that is if we have to understand God's salvation for us. There is always a debtor and an indebted too. Right? Somebody who is borrowed and somebody who is owed something. I've spoken about the eternal offense. How do you pay back that? How do you pay back an eternal offense? It has to be. Money's not going to cut it. How many of us have, um, in English have, have done Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice? You've done Merchant of Venice. What did, what did Shylock want? He wanted the power of flesh. And he had specific instructions for that. The power of flesh from the heart. Right? Yeah. So can you imagine? So this was way beyond the power of flesh. Like you, so there is definitely some shedding of blood in order to pay back an eternal offense. And that is what happened. He started having God commanded animal sacrifices as a part of the covenant to reconcile yourself to God. But were animal sacrifices enough? No. You had to keep, if it was enough, you wouldn't have to keep sacrificing animals, right? But it became tradition. You had to keep sacrificing the poor animal on the altar as, as recompense to what happened to, to all. Because it's not that man sinned once and therefore we are paying back for that. No, man continued to sin. Therefore, we have to continue to keep making sacrifices. So one would need to keep shedding one's blood infinitely to repay that, right? But how we're mortal beings, we're finite beings. So mankind was therefore destined at the time for eternal death. Because you could not pay it back, you can't. So the concept of no after life would have made sense that time. You know how people say, there's no afterlife, we just disappear into the universe, we merge with the universe, we become part of the cosmos. Oh, rubbish. Absolute rubbish. But it would have made sense then. Why? Because there was no... That was it. We knew that when we died, that was it for us. We ceased to exist. We were as good as non-existent. Because there was no... There was, there was, we, had, we had cut ties with God. We had broken that bridge with God. So, one can understand then that man's looking to make his life as comfortable as he possibly could rather than preparing for death and what comes after. Okay, at the time, because there was no salvation, there was no, 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 no thought of when we die we'll be with God. No, because God, we had severed our ties with God. So now you can understand down the ages the different religions that started to come out. And it was all about making 
sacrifices to pagan idols, making blood contracts, you know, um, the, the concept of reincarnation that will just come back into the same planet because there's nothing else. You know, so now you start to understand all of this. So it was a bad, it was a bad deal, okay? So, what is the solution to an eternal offense? The solution is an eternal sacrifice. Who is eternal? God is eternal. Whose blood, blood therefore, would tally the eternal offense? God's own blood. But how could he shed blood? He's not. He's not like us. So this is the mystery of the incarnation, the mystery of his death, and the mystery of his resurrection. In the very act of becoming one of us, God had already started the story of our salvation. Up until this passion, you don't think God would have experienced pain? You don't think he would have he would have experienced all the discomforts that human life is. He didn't have to. He really didn't have to. But he chose to become one of us so that we may become him. So what do we believe? Okay. Salvation comes through Christ alone. Okay. Contrary to what the other sects of Christianity think the Catholics believe, Catholic Church is very clear, salvation comes through Christ alone. We don't save ourselves, Christ has saved us. Remember the Nicene Creed, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. That is the important part. It's a whole one line with punctuation and a full stop that is dedicated to this concept. For us man and for our salvation he came down. So now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed you from the law of sin and death. So that means because of Jesus' shedding of his blood, because of Jesus' incarnation, because of his resurrection, that no longer has a claim for us. Now you're going to say, hold on. We just lost somebody last week. That person is dead. He's gone. For most of us, death is a very real thing, especially if we've lost a loved one very close to us. So what gives? You don't seem to be freed from us. It seems that death is still there. Sin is still there, but yet it says that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed you from the law of sin and death. So what does that mean? How does this tally? How do, how do we reconcile that? Any any thoughts? There's, Jesus has freed us from sin and that, yet there's still sin, we know. We don't have to go very far. There's still death, we know. So how do we reconcile that? Any thoughts? So is what Jesus is saying not true? Can't be. He's God. His words don't change. He can't be coming back and saying, oh, what I meant was, no. Right? So what do you think? Why 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 is sin and death still abandoned? Hmm? Okay, but that still has a claim on us. But according to scripture, that no longer has a claim on us. For example, Jesus' death and resurrection brings us deliverance from sin and death, which no longer have a final claim on us. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? 
You've often heard this, right? Especially at funerals. Where your death is your victory, where is your sin? How do we understand this, especially when we lost a loved one? So this is where we think about the process of salvation. Salvation was not just Jesus died and salvation for man. See, think about, think about the beginning. God created us as this is where you fill in the lines. Sorry? He created us in his image and likeness. And what did he create us as? Free beings. Free beings in his image and likeness. What do you think the purpose was? An infinitely good God wanted to make you and me. Why? I think he would have wanted to go beyond that. He made us free beings in his image and likeness for the purpose of becoming just like him. That we would freely grow into him, into him. Like, you know, when you're in a factory, you make molds for certain uh, toys and things. Only that toy would fit the description, right, of the circuitry and everything you put into it. Not for anything else, you can't fill it with jello or something, right? For our intended purpose was to become like him. And therefore we made his, in his image and likeness. Therefore, Adam and Eve's test. Of all the trees in paradise, they were forbidden to eat from one tree. Now, do you think God was scared that they would suddenly become knowledgeable? No. But God's very nature is love. And he had created Adam and Eve to love like he loves. And part of his nature of love is, an, is a self-giving, it's an obedience, it's docility. So he gave Adam and Eve the chance to learn one of the first things, obedience. Just trust and obedience. Just not putting myself in the center. What did he do? She put herself, she allowed herself to become the center. Says, no, I want to get for mine. And then Adam too said, oh, the woman is going to die, I must also get it. So it became that thing of, I am self-sufficient, I don't need God. But look at the Trinity. God is ever emptying himself to the Son. The Son is emptying himself in turn back to God. That exchange is so intense, it forms the third person, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is love, the love between the Father and the Son. So, they had the potential, Adam and Eve, to become even more glorious than they were created. Just in this simple command, by obeying that simple command. God didn't expect anything else other than this one thing. He gave them everything. It's not like he restricted one tree, one fruit of that tree. Right? He gave them everything. He asked them to be obeyed. So God, in giving this test, is not a sadistic God. He wants us to cooperate. He wants us to be obedient, to be to cooperate in this plan that he has for us. He wants us to grow with him. He could have, like I said, snapped his fingers and made all of us perfect images of himself. But no, he wants us in our personality, in our will, to become like him. And to become like him is, is an amazing thing. Who wouldn't want to? Right? So therefore, God down the ages has been preparing man to become like him, to go back to the original plan and more, to be raised even above the angels, right? Jesus' first public words were,
first public words when he started his ministry. Oh, when he was lost in the temple? When he started his ministry. 30-year-old Jesus. What did you start by saying? Public forum. When you started teaching. Repent and believe in the gospel. But see these words escape us because it's said so often. Ah, repent. Okay. I'm bringing that some back for confession. Okay. But I think it goes much deeper than that. Alright? So repent and believe in the gospel. Mark chapter 1 verse 15. I need you to reflect on that. Because that sentence is directed to you. Even now. It is directed to you. Jesus wants you to know that. Repent and believe in the gospel. So here was Jesus rallying up the troops. He said, I have come to save mankind from eternal death. I will make things right. But I need you all to start getting ready now. Because what is to come is the eternal kingdom, is eternal life. You need to be ready for eternal life. Believe in the gospel. Believe in the good news. The good news is man doesn't have to worry about what will happen when he dies. And man doesn't have to be afraid of death anymore. So we are therefore living this ongoing process of salvation. Why? Let's go back to the Nicene Creed. What was the last line? I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Yes, we will die, but death will not have the last word. Each of us, according to the degree with which we lived our life according to the gospel, will be restored into our bodies. Do you know that? Do you understand that? That at the end of time, all of us will get our bodies back? You understand that? We will all get our bodies back. One of the mystics uh, uh, said this, that at the end of time, God will command the elements to release back that part of you. So wherever you've disappeared, wherever you've gone, you've gone into the ground, God will call you back. Because only God can do that. Remember, um, I think it was uh, Jeremiah, was it Jeremiah who was brought into the valley of uh, the, the bones and he said prophesy over the bones and the bones started to put themselves together and muscles and sinew and skin formed over them. There was an army of people and they were still not alive until God breathed into them life. So that's a foretaste of what, what was going to happen on the last day. That our souls will be joined back with our bodies on the last day. So that doesn't have, a, have its claim on us. It doesn't. You knew that, right? It's part of the creed. The res resurrection of the dead. Not his resurrection. That's finished. It's our resurrection. We're all going to resurrect. You're going to look at me like I'm, I'm, I'm nuts. It's true. It's, it's a, look it up. Look it up at the galleries of the Catholic faith. That's, that's our faith. Yeah? So isn't that good news? It's good news to me. I happen to like my body. Yeah? yeah? So this is something that we need to think about. That is the salvation. That is the salvation of God. It's an ongoing salvation. And God wants us to cooperate with that salvation. He wants our yes. Just like Mary said yes. He wants our yes. He wants our fiat. Alright? So, therefore, when we say we work out our salvation in trembling, it doesn't mean that by our good works we'll be saved. No. It means that when we work out our salvation in fear and trembling, what is the fear talking about? It's the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord in Proverbs 8, 13 is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And God alone gives us the grace to make these good works. We think that when we commit an act of kindness, 
we are doing it. It's the spirit dwelling within us that makes that makes our good works good works. All the saints down the ages, the the, the miracles they would they would uh, perform and the lives they led was all because of the spirit of God and their submission to the spirit of God. They would constantly say, come Holy Spirit, take over. They knew that they could not do it on their own. Think of St. Francis of Assisi. He came from a very wealthy family. I mean, very wealthy. For those of you who have not seen Brother, Son, Sister Moon, I, I highly recommend that movie to you. Brother, Son, Sister Moon. It's about the life of, um, of um, St. Francis and how he lived an elaborate life. Like he was like the shakes, as good as that. And yet he went down to poverty. Who is able to do that? And Francis, if he was standing right here, he says, it was not me. Because if I was left to do it on my own, I would not even begin to start that journey. It was all the spirit. And he, little by little, said yes, yes, yes. All that God requires of us is our yes. And think about it. It is as simple as that. We make it complicated. Then she said, I can say yes if these are my conditions. Because we've already decided for ourselves that God's plan is not is not perfect. That no, 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 I don't think you know me. I need you to do this, 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 then I can say yes to you. We make it complicated. Alright? So anyway. So you are called, the takeaway is this, you are called to repent and believe. Believe, have faith in the salvation of God. Faith as big as a mustard seed is really an act of your will. Okay, it's not a nice feeling. It's not some thunderbolt that hits you and you say, you know what, I'm going to go to Africa and you know spread the word of God, or I'm going to go to the Middle East and spread the word of God. It's not that. It's an act of faith. You faith. You have faith in Jesus. You trust in Jesus. Now let me. Let me um, tell you a story on how faith can be personified for you. So, in 1859, there was this man, Charles Blondin. Have you heard of him? He was a tightrope walker. Okay, Charles Blondin is a tightrope walker. You know what a tightrope walker is? They hold a pole and they balance themselves on this, this metal rope that's stretched between two points and they do this thing. Charles Blondin, one of his many feats was to walk a tightrope between the Niagara Gorge, which is connecting Canada and the US. It's a, it's a significant distance and underneath it's just ferocious waterfall. So he walked the length of that, up and down, up and down. People are cheering, yay, hey, Charles Brown, oh, he's amazing. Like, up and down, he kept going, and different feats, blindfolded, all sorts of things, all right? So he comes back and he tells the people, do you believe I can do it one more time? And they all said, yeah, go Charles, go Charles, you know? All right, are you sure? Yeah. Go, Charles, do it, do it, do it. You know, this money of this and everything. Go, you can do it. All right. Who would like to pick it up? <coughs> Everyone went silent. They saw him walk up and down. They saw him do these incredible feats, blindfolded and doing all sorts of things while walking up and down. But nobody wanted to risk getting on his back except his own manager and his manager piggybacked on him and he proceeded to walk, he stopped midway, cooked an omelet, ate it and continued further down. Only his manager had faith as big as a mustard seed. That is what God is calling you to do. 
calling you to take that leap of faith. You have no money in your bank account? Give it to Jesus. But I need to pay rent? Give it to Jesus. But the rent is due tomorrow? Give it to Jesus. I am standing witness that during the pandemic, Callan and I had nothing but a hundred dirhams left in an account and we had to pay rent. And Jesus made that happen. So give it to Jesus. This is what faith is. Your faith will be tested. And each time it's tested, it will either grow or it will shrink. You decide what will happen. So that's your take away. All right? The salvation of God is for all of mankind. It is for you even now. But God calls you to repent and believe. And have faith when he says believe. So we're going to break into our, uh, into our groups now. And we have two sharing questions. I need you to write this down if you can. So the first question is, think about a time that you were in debt. And a debt that you really wanted to be free from. I'm sure we want to be free from all debt, but this particular debt is really, it's occupying my mind every day. It's, it's just bringing me down. I can't live my life. How would you describe that feeling of being in debt? That's the first question. The second question is, after all that we've discussed about the salvation of God, what does the salvation of God mean to you now, personally? What does the salvation of God now mean to you personally? And at the end of the sharing, we've concluded session uh, two. We will continue to unpack what the salvation of God means for us and how we can how we can have that salvation, how we can say yes to the salvation of God going forward, okay? In the sessions to come, we are now preparing to fully participate in the salvation of God. Now that we have an understanding of what it means, okay? So come, we will break out into our groups uh, straight away.